good morning everyone in today's lecture we will discuss about uh, intestinal diverticula so intestine the diverticula is just a abnormal outpouching of uh, hollow viscous that is what we call diverticula so this outpouching of hollow viscous can occurs in gastrointestinal tract as well as even it can occurs in uh, bladder as well so in gastrointestinal tract it can occur in the esophagus even in the esophagus or even it can occurs in the colon or even in the small intestine so that is what uh, uh, the diverticula means but here today we will discuss about intestinal diverticula so it is very important because in your structured essay question also there can be a scenario and clinical scenario and uh, the questions can be asked about the diverticula or even it can be given as uh, uh, short notes the write short notes on certain types of uh, diverticula as well as there are several mcqs it is related to diverticula so you should understand the basic concept as well as how you manage a person with diverticula so before we go into the sections you can uh, you can read some questions so it is one of the single best answer question a 10 month old child presented with fresh parietal bleeding for two days duration on examination the child was pale and is irritable there was a tachycardia and tachypnea what is the most probable diagnosis can it be a acute gastroenteritis or can it be a intussusception or intestinal polyps or whether it is meckel's diverticulum or colonic diverticuli so we need to uh, find out the answers for this question then the next one again another single best answer question a 60 year old male presented with the profuse parietal bleeding and he is complaints of on and off uh, pain over the left abdomen what is the most probable diagnosis so this question is little similar uh, kind of a questions the previous one the difference is the previous the age is different it is uh, it is in a child but it is in an elderly person so what is the most probable diagnosis whether it is a rectal cancer or whether it is an ulcerative colitis or whether it is a diverticular disease of the colon or whether it is a meckel's diverticulum again and whether it is a hemorrhoids so we have to find out the answer for this so the third question the single best answer again a 62 year old male presented with a left sided abdominal pain for two weeks duration on examination he has marked tenderness over the left iliac fossa he has a previous history of gastroesophageal reflux disease and gold stones and what is the most probable diagnosis again what is the importance about the left sided abdomen as well as he is having a gastroesophageal reflux disease as well as he is having a gold stone as well so all this combination of clinical Uh, clinical features should comes to a diagnosis so we have to find out what is the most probable diagnosis whether it is a gold stone ileus or whether it is a, a peptic ulcer perforation whether it is a diverticular disease of the colon or whether it is a left colonic cancer or whether it is an ulcerative colitis that is what we have to discuss uh, here so that is again another types of single best answer so types of intestinal diverticula so we are not going to discuss about the the bladder diverticula or any other uh, the esophageal mainly the esophageal diverticula is not the part in our lectures today so there are two types of intestinal diverticula it can be a true diverticula or it can be a false diverticula so true diverticula is called again it is called a congenital diverticula and the false one we call it's an acquired so congenital it is it's when the child is born the diverticula is there 
right? And why we call it a true diverticular? Because all the layers of the bowel is there in the diverticular. Even the serosa is there, the muscles are there, even submucosa and the mucosa, all the layers will be found in true diverticuli. That is why we call it a true diverticuli. That is occurring, it's congenitally. You don't get a true diverticuli as an acquired condition. But when it is, comes to acquired, we call it a false diverticuli. Why? Because in this uh, diverticular, you, will, you can see the muscle layer is lacking. So there's no muscle layer when it is, comes to a false diverticuli. You will get a, mainly the mucosa as well as the submucosa only. So these are the two types of intestinal diverticular uh, we need to discuss. So when it is, comes to diverticuli, already we discussed congenital, they have all the layers, but acquired, they have only the mucosa or, uh, and the submucosa. And the acquired, you can divide it into two according to the occurrence. So how it is occurs, we can divide the acquired into two. One is called a pulsion diverticuli. The other one is called traction diverticuli. So pulsion diverticuli is, the, there's a pressure inside the hollow viscous. And because of that, that is pushing the mucosa and submucosa out of the bowel. So that is what we call pulsion. pulsion. It is pushes, it is pushing from inside the lumen. So that is called pulsion. So when there's a pressure inside the lumen, what will happen? Wherever the defective area in the bowel, usually the, in the colon, the, what is the defective area is the entry of uh, blood vessels. So whenever the entry of blood vessels through uh, whatever the bowel, that part is defective. So whenever there's a pressure inside the bowel, what will happen? The, the mucos and the submucosa will be pushed out of that uh, bowel wall through that defect. So that is what we call pulsion diverticuli. So when it is, comes to traction diverticuli, is, the problem is outside the bowel wall. So from the outside, there will be a pulling effect. And because of the pulling effect, the mucos and submucosa will be pulled out of the bowel. So that is what we call traction. Usually whenever there's some inflammatory condition outside the bowel, and whenever there's a fibrosis. So this fibrosis and all that will cause us the traction effect, so the uh, the mucosa will be pulled out. So that is the two type. So diverticuli, we divide it into congenital and acquired. Congenital, it has all the layers. Acquired, it has only the mucosa and the submucosa. And the acquired one, we divide it into pulsion diverticuli. And pulsion is the problem is within the lumen, and that is pushing the mucosa out of the lumen, out of the bowel, through the defective area. It's called pulsion and the traction, the problem is outside the bowel and it is pulling the mucosa and the submucosa out of the bowel. So these are the, the types of diverticuli we need to discuss. So there are two types of uh, intestinal diverticuli we are going to discuss. One is called Meckel's diverticulum and the other one is called diverticular disease of the colon. So we have discussed last time the, the age-related intestinal obstruction the intussusception is more common in children, as well as uh, the sigmoid volvulus is more common in elderly. So like that, here also, we have two various, uh, two uh, types of diverticuli, Meckel's as well as the colonic diverticuli. And you can easily remember, Meckel's is occurs in children mainly, but Meckel's can present in even in an adult, but is mainly it is in the children, as well as when it is, comes to colonic diverticula, it is mainly it is in the elderly. So first one we will discuss about Michael's diverticula. So you can read, there are some questions related to Michael's diverticulum, one of the true or false question. So which of the following are presentations of Michael's diverticulum? Is it uh, gastrointestinal bleeding? That there's any obstruction? diverticulitis, intermittent abdominal pain, or right-sided abdominal pain. So we have to find out the, what are the uh, presentations of uh, diverticuli. Next one, again, a true or false question. So we need to know the Michael's diverticulum is seen in 20% of the population. So we have to know the roughly what is the percentage of people will present with Michael's diverticulum? So that is one of the most important points because uh, we will discuss that later. 
and it's a remnant of vitello-intestinal duct. Is it correct or not? It's a small appendix. And why the appendix is asked in this uh, uh, concept? Uh, that is also there are some reason, so we will discuss that. It's associated with peptic ulceration and may present as acute appendicitis. So that is the true or false question. So if you get a Meckel's diverticulum, already we have discussed it's a true diverticulum. And because why we call it a true diverticulum? It's because it consists of all the layers of the bubble. Even the muscle layer is there in the diverticulum. And it is one of the remnant. That is why we call it a congenital. So it's a remnant of vitello-intestinal tract. Usually the, this vitello-intestinal tract is connecting to the yolk sac. Right, so that is how the transformation of the food from mother to the child, the fetus. So that is the remnant of vitellointestinal tract. So when this is remains, vitellointestinal tract remains, that will call a Meckel's diverticulum. And you can see there's a blood supply to the Meckel's diverticulum as well. So this is also another feature differentiation from colonic diverticula. In colonic diverticula, you don't have a separate blood supply to whatever the diverticula, but when it is, comes to Meckel's diverticulum, there's a separate blood supply to that, right? So that is also, it's indicated it is the true diverticula. And this is the common ano congenital anomaly in gastrointestinal tract, right? So if anybody asks, what is the common type of gastrointestinal anomaly? It is a Meckel's diverticula. And you know, in the bowel, the small bowel, you have uh, two areas, mesentric as well as antimesentric. And Meckel's diverticulum only occurs from antimesentric border. It never occurs from mesentric border. So even in you get an MCQ, Meckel's diverticulum is a outpouching uh, structure from mesentric border is false, right? You only get uh, antimesentric uh, outpouching in uh, Meckel's diverticulum. And sometimes the Meckel's diverticulum is found in hernial sac, right? Mainly it is in the inguinal hernia. Inguinal hernia is the common type. So sometimes if it is found in the hernial sac, we call it a litrous hernia, right? It's called litrous hernia. There's another entity called little hernia, little hernia. So what is the difference between a little hernia and litrous hernia? So little hernia is when the appendix is found inside the hernial sac is called little hernia. So you can, you can remember, you can identify little finger. So little finger is like uh, appendix, right? It is like an appendix. So you can remember easily in that way. So when the appendix is found inside the hernial sac, we call it a little hernia. So remember what little finger. When it is found in the, uh, the Meckel's diverticulum is found in the hernial sac, we call it a litrous hernia. It's one of the entity uh, that's related to Meckel's diverticulum. So there are rule of two in Meckel's diverticulum. So this is very, very important because most of the questions, uh, you can do it with the uh, rule of two, right? So that is, everybody has to uh, remember this. So it is occurs in 2% of the population. That is the first rule, first uh, rule of two. is 2% of the population, it is commonly it is occurs. And usually it is situated two feet from ileocecal junction. So if you take an ileocecal junction, most of the Meckel's diverticula is situated two feet from that, right? And that is in the ilia, right? That is in the ilia. So that is why when we do, uh, when a person, a patient presents with left right-sided abdominal pain and we suspect it's an acute appendicitis and we go for surgery and whenever we do surgery and if we found the appendix is normal, if you find the appendix is normal, then we have to check Meckel's diverticulum because Meckel's diverticulum can mimic as appendicitis. Meckel's diverticulitis can mimic as acute appendicitis. So in that case, we have to check whether the patient is having a uh, Meckel's diverticulum or not. So usually we have to check about the uh, two feet, right? And near to two feet or even three, four feet, that's it, right? We don't have to check the whole small bowel because majority of the Meckel's diverticulum is situated within two feet from the ileocecal junction. So this is the clinical implication of 
this point, right? So that is two feet from the ellipsical junction. And it is usually two inches long. So that is the common uh, length that is two inches. That is the other uh, rule of two. And male is to female ratio is two is to one. So it is more common in males. It's more common in males. And most of the cases it presents within two years of age. So within two years of age is the common presentation, but Meckel's diverticulum can present in any age. Even though it is congenital, most of the Meckel's diverticulum are uh, asymptomatic, and sometimes it is symptomatic after some time, and that the, the symptom occurs even in adults as well. So it is not unique to children, but majority it is present in children less than two years of age. And the next rule of two is usually it is contains two types of mucosa. So about 50% of cases, the Meckel's diverticulum contains two types of mucosa. So uh, what are the two types? So what are the two types? Bowel mucosa is there. So in each and every Meckel's diverticulum, the bowel mucosa is there. So that is invariably it is there. But with the bowel mucosa, there can be any other mucosa. So the other mucosa are we call heterotropic uh, epithelium. So heterotropic epithelium can be from stomach, gastric, or it can be a colonic epithelium, or it can be a pancreatic tissues. So these are, we call heterotropic tissues or heterotropic ep epithelium. Out of these, the gastric is the commonest type. So 50% of heterotropic mucosa will be gastric. So in 50% cases, you have two types of mucosa. Out of that, 50% will be gastric mucosa. So gastric mucosa will be the commonest type in when it is, comes to heterotopic uh, epithelium or heterotopic tissues. So we have bowel mucosa with that. Majority, there will be a, a gastric mucosa, or gastric tissues, or sometimes colonic or sometimes pancreatic. So these are the two types of uh, uh, mucosa is there in Meckel's diverticulum. Again, it is the, if we take the management, management is uh, depends on whether this kind of a uh, uh, mucosa is, uh, remains in the Meckel's diverticulum or not. That's we will discuss as well as even in investigation is also it is important because of the gastric mucosa. So we have to know about there are two types of mucosa. It is there in Meckel's diverticulum. What are the clinical presentation? If you take the clinical presentation, Majority are asymptomatic. So majority of the patients, uh, the Meckel's diverticulum is found incidentally. So whenever we do laparotomy or whenever we do any abdominal surgery, the most of the Meckel's diverticulum is found uh, as an uh, incidental finding. So it is most of the time it is asymptomatic. But sometimes they present with bleeding, right? They can have a profuse bleeding. That is the most common presentation uh, presenting symptom in children. So that is the most common presenting symptom in children. And bleeding can vary in severity. Sometimes the bleeding can be very mild. So in that case, the child will present with anemia. And whenever the child presents with anemia, if we check the fecal occult blood, that will be positive. Right? That will be positive. So fecal occult blood will be positive and child will have anemia that indicate there are some small amount of bleeding from the Meckel's diverticulum is one of the extreme. Or sometimes they can present with melina. So usually melina is the presentation of upper gastrointestinal tract problem, uh, bleeding. So whenever the esophageal problem or a stomach, mainly the stomach bleeding, that is the common presentation, people comes with uh, melina. But Meckel's diverticulum also presents with melina. Sometimes there can be a maroon color stool, maroon stools. So that is also one of the presentation of Meckel's diverticulum. And there can be an acute hemorrhage or a mass massive bleeding from Meckel's diverticulum. So that is also one of the presentation in Meckel's diverticulum. So you can remember the previous question we have asked in a child presents with the massive uh, PR bleeding or massive hemorrhage. We have to think about uh, Meckel's diverticulum. So that is the common uh, condition that presents with uh, massive PR bleeding. But uh, massive PR bleeding is not the common presentation in Meckel's diverticulum. But 
that is if when someone comes with uh, some child comes with the massive pr bleeding we have to think about meckel's diverticulum is the first cause but meckel's diverticulum usually it is patient presents with anemia or melina or sometimes with the maroon stools and meckel's diverticulum can get inflamed and that is what we call meckel's diverticulitis and then the child will presents with abdominal pain same features of acute appendicitis so we can't differentiate it's very difficult to differentiate appendicitis from meckel's diverticulum whenever a person comes with meckel's diverticulitis so they can comes with the sudden onset of abdominal pain right so it is a continuous pain there will be a tenderness over the right iliac fossa there will be a guarding right localized guarding there can be a localized tenderness and child can have a fever so all these features is mimic as acute appendicitis so that is also one of the presentation and sometimes there will be a intestinal obstruction why because the meckel's diverticulum is a remnant of vitello intestinal tract so when there is a remnant of vitello intestinal tract there can be a connection to the umbilicus with a band so vitello intestinal tract can have an uh, communication with the band into the uh, uh, umbilicus so in that case what will happen around that band the small bubble can twist a right? small bubble can twist so because of that they can develop intestinal obstruction so meckel's diverticulum is one of the remnant of vitello intestinal tract so because of that remnant some part of the vitello intestinal tract will be replaced by fibrosis so there will be a communication between the meckel's diverticulum and the umbilicus through the fibrosis so because of that around that uh, axis or the fibrosis fibrous tissues there will be a twisting of small bubble so that can leads to intestinal obstruction so that is also one of the presentation in meckel's diverticulum into susception again we have discussed previously meckel's diverticulum will act as a lead point in into susception so they can present with into susception so that is also one of the presentation then they can have a chronic peptic ulcer why because already i have mentioned you can have a gastric mucosa that is inside the meckels so whenever there's a gastric mucosa inside the meckels that will cause us peptic ulcer disease so whenever there's a peptic ulcer disease they will comes with an intermittent pain so if you take the pain well, already i have mentioned in meckels diverticulitis you can have an abdominal pain that is a continuous pain mimic as acute appendicitis but sometimes patient can have an intermittent pain but intermittent pain is not due to meckel's diverticulitis that is due to chronic peptic ulcer disease so chronic peptic ulcer disease uh, or peptic ulcer chronic peptic ulcers is again due to the gastric mucosa inside the meckel's so that is again one of the uh, presentation in meckel's diverticulum and the meckel's diverticulum can perforate so whenever there is some inflammation sometimes it can perforate and that can cause us generalized peritonitis as well so meckel's like ruptured appendix or a perforated appendix even the meckel's diverticulum can perforate and that can present with generalized peritonitis so that is also one of the presentation so in this the most important thing you should remember you should understand is in children the common presentation is bleeding and in adult the common presentation is abdominal pain so if you can remember the bleeding and abdominal pain the common presentations in children is bleeding and the common presentation in adult is abdominal pain and abdominal pain can be a continuous pain due to meckel's diverticulitis or it can be an intermittent pain due to chronic peptic ulcer because of the gastric mucosa rarely meckel's diverticulum can cause intestinal obstruction or in, in into susception in children and sometime it can perforate but majority of the meckel's diverticulum is asymptomatic so that is what we have to know in under the clinical presentation so if you take investigation so if you take the investigation there are mainly two types of investigation that is a small bowel enema as well as technetium 99 so these are the main two types of investigation so if we suspect any meckel's diverticulum in uh, any children or anybody 
right? So in children presents with some PR bleeding or anemia with uh, occur, fecal occult blood, then we should think that whether there's any Meckel staviculum. So in that case, there are mainly two types of investigations we can use. One is small bowel edema and the other one is technetium 99. So even though we call it edema, right? We don't insert the barium or contrast through the rectum in this case. So we don't uh, do it through the rectum. So small bowel enemas are done through a nasojejunal tube. So we have to insert a nasojejunal tube. And through the nasojejunal tube, we have to uh, give the contrast. So in this picture, the X-ray, you can see uh, the Meckel's very well because of the small bowel enema. Next investigation is technetium 99. So technetium 99 is mainly it is absorbed in the, uh, the stomach mucosa. So it is in the picture you can see it is mainly up, uh, the uptake is mainly into the stomach mucosa, stomach. Why? Because that is, it is, the uptake is more with the stomach mucosa. But when the gastric mucosa is there in the Meckel's, so that is what we call heterotopic mucosa. Most commonly it is a gastric mucosa. So there are two types of mucosa can occur in Meckel's diverticulum, all we have discussed. So when the gastric mucosa is there in the Meckel's, then the uptake will be there in the gastric mucosa as well. So then definitely we can identify the Meckel's with technetium 99. And lower, when it is absorbed and this is excreted via the urine and when it can be seen in the bladder as well. So that is why you can, you can see the increased uptake in the stomach and there's an increased uptake in the meckles as well as there will be an uptake in the, the bladder because of the excretion. So if we see the uptake around the right iliac fossa, it is indicated it's meckles. But when the gastric mucosa is there in the meckles, then only the uptake will be there and we can detect with the technetium 99. But majority, I have told you 50% of the time, uh, there will be a gastric mucosa. So we can identify with technetium 99. So these are the main two investigations. So again, you should understand majority of the uh, Meckel's are asymptomatic and it is found incidentally whenever we do surgery or whenever we do uh, whenever we do abdominal surgery. But in a child, if we suspect it is a Meckel's diverticulum, then the, these are the two investigations, small bowel enema and technetium 99. The treatment. So treatment, there are two various types of treatment it is there. One is called diverticulectomy. Diverticulectomy is just removing the diverticuli only. We are removing only the diverticuli. So that is called diverticulectomy. Right? That's called diverticulectomy. Or we can go for a, the part of the bowel with the meckles, and then we can go for a anastomosis. Right? We can go for an anastomosis. So the question is, to whom we do diverticulectomy and to whom we do resection and anastomosis. So if we think there are two mucosa in the meckles, mainly the gastric mucosa, and that patient presents mainly with bleeding. So that kind of a people, we have to go for a resection and anastomosis. So resection and anastomosis is for two, uh, if a meckles diverticulum is having two mucosa, and when they present mainly with bleeding, then we have to go for a resection and anastomosis. And if there's no two type of mucosa and there's no bleeding, right? bleeding indicate it is from the gastric mucosa. But if there's no bleeding, then we can go for a diverticulectomy. So if a person comes with a diverticulitis and only the diverticula is inflamed and there, if we can't feel any uh, thickened mucosa inside, then we can go for a diverticulectomy. So that is the difference between the how to decide diverticulectomy or resection and anastomosis. So this is what you should remember. So the basically, if any, any child presents with bleeding and we suspect it is there's a gastric mucosa in the uh, Meckel's diverticulum, we have to go for a resection and anastomosis. And if we don't think there's two mucosa in the in Meckel's, then we can go for a diverticulectomy. So then we can 
just recall whatever we have done in TOEFL. So we have done Michael's diverticulum. So which of the following are presentations of Michael's diverticulum? Gastrointestinal bleeding. Yes, that is the common presentation in children. That is what we have discussed. There are uh, a range of bleeding. It can bleed from, it can bleed as an uh, just a occult bleeding and child presents with anemia or the other extremes, they can come with the massive uh, rectal bleeding as well. So that is true. Then the obstruction. Obstruction is intestinal obstruction, I already told you. Whenever there's a band is uh, attached with the nickels, then it can cause obstruction because of the twisting of bowel around that band. So that is also one of the presentation. And diverticulitis, yes, Michael's diverticulitis will come, the person will present with uh, continuous abdominal pain and it is mimic as acute appendicitis and it is more common in adult. So in adult, more common presentation is diverticulitis and in children, common presentation is bleeding. Intermittent abdominal pain, yes, we have discussed even without a continuous pain, you can have an intermittent abdominal pain because of the gastric mucosa and the peptic ulcer, right? Because of the peptic ulcers, they can have intermittent abdominal pain. Then right-sided abdominal pain, yes, that is why because the most of the meckles are situated two feet from ileocecal junction. When it is two feet from ileocecal junction, it is in the terminal ileum. So it is in the terminal ileum, most of the meckles will present with right-sided abdominal pain and that will mimic as acute appendicitis. So that is also true. Meckel's diverticulum, again, true or false, is seen in 20% of the population. Again, uh, this is why I told you, you should remember the rule of two. If you remember the two lo rule of two, there are a lot of uh, information you can gather with Meckel's diverticulum. So it is seen in 20% of the population is false. That is 2% of the population. And is a remnant of vitello intestinal duct? Yes, that is, we have discussed that is one of, that is the congenital anomaly and it is called true diverticuli. Is a small appendix? No, Meckel's diverticulum is a separate one. So it is the correlation of the appendix and the Meckel's is because of the, the hernia I have told earlier. Uh, when the Meckel's is found inside the hernial sac, we call it a litrous hernia. And when the appendix is found inside the hernial sac, we call it a littles hernia. Always remember the little finger. Is associated with peptic ulceration. Yes, Meckel's diverticulum can have uh, gastric mucosa. So whenever there's a gastric mucosa, that can cause peptic ulceration. And what, if anyone asks, what are the presentation uh, due to the gastric mucosa inside the Meckel's, you can say, there are two kinds of presentation they can have. They can have a bleeding, even massive bleeding can occur because of the pept, uh, gastric mucosa inside. At the same time, the gastric mucosa can cause peptic ulceration. So the person can present with intermittent pain or child can present with intermittent pain. And the next one may present as acute appendicitis, yes. So that is Meckel's is one of the differential diagnoses for acute appendicitis. So these are the important things we wanted to discuss in Meckel's diverticuli. Diverticuli, we divide it into true and false. And true diverticuli, one of the example is Meckel's diverticuli. And false diverticuli, one of the example is diverticular disease of the colon. So diverticular disease of the colon. Next condition we have to discuss about diverticular disease of the colon. So before we go into the detail, we can see there are some questions, true or false. So which of the following statesmen regarding diverticular disease of the colon is true? A high fiber diet causes the diverticular disease. So we have to know whether the diverticular disease is related to any diet. The next one, this diverticular consists of mucosa and the other muscles and the other parts that already we have discussed. The diverticular disease of the colon is a false diverticuli, so it won't contain all the layers of the bowel. And those with inflammatory mass have 10 times more mortality than those of perforation. So whether the mortality is higher with inflammation or whether the mortality is higher with perforation. 
what is the commonest cause for mortality and what is the commonest cause for morbidity. So that is what we have to differentiate in this question. We have to check that. And diverticulitis is the principal cause of uh, morbidity. So that's what already I mentioned. And it is congenital. So already we have found the answer for this. It is not congenital, it is an acquired condition. So this is the question we need to answer. Next one, true or false. So which of the following are complications of uh, diverticular disease of colon? So what are the complications? Whether there's a paracolic abscess, whether there's any fistulae formation, whether there's any gastro, lower gastrointestinal hemorrhage, whether there's any carcinoma that is complicated from diverticular disease, or whether there's any stricture due to diverticular disease. So we need to know what are the complications of diverticular disease of the colon. So there are terminologies we need to discuss when it is comes to diverticular uh, disease or diverticuli. So when we call this a colonic diverticula, it is just a hollow outpouching structure, right? Hollow outpouching structures we call it a diverticula. But when we see the diverticula, and that is most of, that is asymptomatic, then we call it a diverticulosis, right? Diverticulosis. So that is the term difference from diverticula and the diverticulosis is a asymptomatic diverticula we call diverticulosis. But the, the person is having any symptoms of diverticula, then we call it a diverticular disease. So that is the important things about the diverticular disease of the colon. So diverticula can occur in the large bubble. So most of the time it is occurs in sigmoid colon. So 90% of the time it is occurs in the sigmoid colon. But sometimes you can have a sequel, uh, you can have sequel diverticular as well. So it can occur in sigmoid colon or it can occur in the cecum, like even in volvulus. Volvulus, we have discussed the common places of volvulus are in the sigmoid colon and the cecum and it is twisting towards the midline. So just to recall whatever we have done earlier. So like that, even in diverticuli of the colon also, it is occurs in sigmoid colon as well as the cecum, but commonly 90% of the time, it is occurs from sigmoid colon. And it is more common in elderly people. So diverticular disease of the colon is more common in elderly people, and it is an acquired uh, diverticuli, we have discussed that. So this is why we call it a false diverticuli. So even in the picture, you can see the muscle layer is not there in the diverticuli and how this diverticuli is outpouching through the, the weakness through the blood vessel. So whatever the blood vessel is blood supply to the colon, there's a weakness. So whenever there's a pressure inside the bubble is there, then there will be outpouching through that weakness. That is how the diverticular disease of the colon is uh, formed. So, the, so I have told you there are two types of uh, acquired diverticuli, pulsion diverticuli and traction diverticuli. So in the pulsion diverticuli I have mentioned, there should be a pressure inside the lumen. So whenever there's a pressure inside the lumen, what will happen? There will be a ballooning effect. So ballooning effect of uh, mucosa through the defect. So that defect is formed by the vascular penetration. So whenever there's a vascular penetration, there will be a defect. So the question is how the pressure inside the lumen is increased to cause this pulsion diverticular. So the pressure is due to reduced fiber in the diet. So whenever there's a low fiber diet, there will be increased pressure inside the lumen. So that is that will cause us uh, the pulsion diverticuli. That is, the, that is how the diverticular disease of the colon occurs. So remember the diet, it's, it's not due to high fiber diet. High fiber diet is uh, usually the diverticular disease is not occurs due to high fiber diet. So that is why it is less common in Asian countries, right? In Asian countries, the diverticular disease is less common because of high fiber diet, but it's in the Western countries because of the poor fibers in the diet, it is more common. And it is not a precancerous condition, remember that. So cancer is not a complication of diverticular disease. So if, if, uh, if any question that is asked 
whether the diverticular disease causes colonic cancer, it's wrong. It won't cause colonic cancers. But in 12% of the time, around 12% of the time, the colonic cancers can coexist with diverticular disease. So that is the relationship between the cancer, colonic cancer and the diverticular disease. So that is the important one, but it is not a precancerous condition and diverticular disease won't cause uh, colonic cancers. And there's one entity we call Saint's Triad. So everybody should know there's a Saint's Triad. So what is Saint's Triad? There's three important conditions that will be that will coexist. One is hiatus hernia, gallstones, and diverticular disease. So in the previous question, you can uh, recall why in that question the, it is mentioned about gastroesophageal reflux disease and gallstone, and everything is related to left-sided abdominal pain because of this Saint's triad. So in Saint's triad, the diverticular disease can coexist. Right, so diverticular disease, gallstone, and hiatus hernia is considered as Saint's triad. And in hiatus hernia, the common presentation is gastroesophageal reflux disease. So that is how uh, the diverticular disease patient can have gastroesophageal reflux disease as well. When it is, comes to complications of diverticular disease of the colon, most of the diverticular disease of the colon are asymptomatic. Again, like a Meckel's diverticulum, the diverticular disease of the colon also it is majority, it is asymptomatic. And most of the time it is found incidentally. For example, whenever we do any laparotomy or abdominal surgery, we can see there are some diverticula in the um, uh, sigmoid colon and sometimes from the cecum. Or whenever we do colonoscopy or endoscopy for any other reason, then we can see there are some and diverticuli. So that is the incidental. But about 10 to 30 percent of the time, it can cause us some complications. So, what are the complications they can have? They can, have, they can develop a diverticulitis because of the inflammation of the diverticuli. There can be a diverticulitis or it can perforate. So, whenever it is perforate, they can lead to peritonitis or it can lead to pericolic abscess or even psoas abscess, anything. So perforation is again one of the complications of uh, diverticular disease of the colon. So whenever there are inflammation or even whenever there's a perforation, there can be fibrosis around the diverticuli. So whenever there are fibrosis around the diverticuli, that can cause us intestinal obstruction as well. So diverticular disease of the colon can lead to intestinal obstruction as well. They can lead to hemorrhage. So diverticular disease of the colon can bleed profusely and that can lead to a profuse PR bleeding. So hemorrhage is one of the complications in diverticular disease of the colon. Sometimes because of the perforation, right? It's a silent perforation can cause us fistula formation. So when the perforation is severe, patient will develop an abscess or a peritonitis. But when the perforation is mild and it is uh, silent, then they can develop a fistula formation. So fistula formation can, present, can cause us a bladder fistula or even the vaginal fistulas or enteric or cutaneous fistula. So these are the fistula formation can occur due to diverticular disease of the colon. So these are the complications everybody knows. This is, comes as a clinical features as well, but these are complications due to diverticular disease. So if you take clinical features, there are mainly four types of clinical features we need to discuss. So diverticular disease of the colon can present as a mild form, or diverticular disease of the colon can present with inflammation, that is diverticulitis, or it can present with hemorrhage, or it can lead to fistula formation. So these are the main clinical features a diverticular disease of the colon presents. So when it is, comes to mild features, what are the mild feature features? They can have abdominal distension, they can have a flatulence, or sometimes there will be a sensation of heaviness in the lower abdomen. So these people, usually they will go to the, the, the they will defecate very frequently, but even they go to the toilet, there are a small amount of uh, stools will go, that is because of the, they feel the sensation of heaviness. And it is usually mimic as, irritable bowel syndrome. So 
mild features is is mimic as irritable bowel syndrome so usually everybody knows the irritable bowel syndrome is diagnosed with exclusion so whenever you exclude any other pathology or any other conditions then only we diagnose a irritable bowel syndrome but in uh, diverticular disease there are obvious pathologies there there is an obvious pathology but with that they will have the features of irritable bowel syndrome so that is the feature of mild uh, clinical feature in diverticular disease of the colon when it is comes to diverticulitis so next clinical feature is diverticulitis the diverticulitis presents with persistent lower abdominal pain in the left iliac fossa so that is because of the inflammation sometimes they can have a diarrhea or constipation and there will be a lower abdominal tenderness it's like acute appendicitis on the right side causing the same kind of abdominal pain tenderness localized guarding and rigidity same kind of a problem they can develop in the left sided abdomen as well so that is the important things about uh, uh, diverticular disease of the colon uh, that is a left sided abdominal pain and there will be a tender mass in digital rectal examination whenever there is a abscess formation so whenever there is an abscess formation the abscess will be filled up in the pelvis so they can develop a pelvic abscess so whenever there is a pelvic abscess whenever we do a digital rectal examination we can feel as a boggy mass we call it a boggy mass so boggy mass is indicate there is a possible abscess formation so these are the clinical features due to diverticulitis so the patient can present with persistent lower abdominal pain in the left, left iliac fossa there can be a diarrhea or sometimes they can present with constipation low abdominal tenderness will be there and there will be a tender mass in digital rectal examination in abscess formation so these are the clinical features due to diverticulitis there are clinical features due to hemorrhage so hemorrhage they can present with painless and profuse uh, bleeding so remember the hemorrhage can occurs without diverticulitis so even without diverticulitis patient can develop uh, bleeding so whenever they present bleeding they can have a left sided abdominal pain or even without abdominal pain they can have bleeding so it can be a painless and profuse bleeding and sometimes they will pass some bright uh, red uh, clots so that is also one of the presentation of hemorrhage so these are the clinical features due to hemorrhage so there are clinical features due to fistula formation so whenever there is a fistula formation they can have colo vesical fistula so that is the fistula formation in between the colon and bladder there is a fistula formation between colon and bladder so that is what we call colo vesical fistula so whenever there is a colo vesical fistula they will present with pneumaturia pneumaturia there is a air inside the colon is goes into the bladder there is no air inside the bladder so whenever you see a air inside the bladder that indicate there is some communication with the colon so that is how we identify there is a colo vesical fistula even whenever we do a ct scan in the ct scan you can see there is a air inside the uh, uh, bladder so when there is air inside the bladder whenever they pass urine there will be some frothy uh, urine with with some air so that is what we call pneumaturia and sometimes they can pass some fecal matters so that is what we call fecal urea and because of the feces inside the bladder they can get infection re uh, repeatedly so they can present with recurrent urinary tract infection so recurrent urinary tract infection is due to the continuous fistula is there in between the colon and the bladder so there are, can be a colo vaginal fistula so whenever there is a colo vaginal fistula it is common after hysterectomy a person undergoing a hysterectomy there is a possibility they can develop colo vaginal fistula with uh, diverticular disease of the colon not only this two even the fistula formation can occurs with other intestine right so other intestine or even the fistula formation can occurs with the skin so that is what we call uh, cutaneous fistula right cutaneous fistula so that is also can present can occur due to uh, diverticular disease of the colon so these are the clinical features you should know about the diverticular disease of the colon they can have a mild form 
or they can have a diverticulitis. Diverticulitis can cause a certain problem or the hemorrhage can cause uh, certain clinical features and the fistula formation can cause us certain problem. And we have discussed there are perforation can occur because of the diverticular disease. So whenever there's a perforation occurs in diverticular disease, then that can have some various types of presentation. So because of this, there's a diverticulitis, it's classified into four grade in the hinge shape classification. So in the grade one, if you see only the mesentric or pericolic abscess, mesentric or pericolic abscess only, then we call it a grade one uh, perforation. Then whenever there's a grade two, that is called pelvic abscess, so this perforation and that can cause abscess and it is comes to the pelvis. Or sometimes they can comes with the peritonitis, but the reason for peritonitis is because of the abscess or a pus. So that is called parulan peritonitis. So that is due to grade three. It's called grade three. But when the perforation is, is uh, massive and whenever there's a fecal matter, it is contaminating the peritoneum, then we call it a fecal peritonitis. So that is what we call grade four. So according to the perforation, as well as the clinical features and the formation of abscess, we can divide the uh, diverticulitis into four, grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four. Investigation. How will you investigate whenever uh, as somebody is having a suspicion of diverticular disease? So whenever there's a diverticular disease, if we suspect there's a perforation, then we have to go for an erect chest x-ray. So in the erect chest x-ray, there will be a gas under the diaphragm, right? There will be a gas under the diaphragm. So that is one of the investigation uh, we have to do it. Then we can do a spiral CT. Right, spiral CT. So even the spiral CT, we can detect all the uh, perforation or even uh, any other inflammation. Everything we can identify with spiral CT. Or sometimes we can go for a barium enema. So usually enema, it is not used if we suspect perforation. We can use a water soluble contrast, but the usual normal barium is not used whenever there is a perforation is suspected. But if there's no perforation is suspected and if you just want to identify the uh, diverticular disease, then we can go for a barium enema. The appearance in barium enema is called so teeth appearance. So this is what we can, uh, you can see the so teeth appearance in barium. So this is a so, it is the same appearance of a so. So that is what we call so teeth appearance in barium enema. Or we can go for endoscopy. The endoscopy, we can identify the diverticular disease in the colon. So that is, uh, that is a very easiest way to identify diverticular disease. As well as if we suspect any associated malignancy, then even we can go for a biopsy with uh, endoscopy. So biopsy is very, very important. Whenever we suspect there's a possibility of malignancy because diverticular disease, never cause colonic cancer, but diverticular disease can coexist with colonic cancer in about 12% of the people. So biopsy is, is mandatory in that kind of equivocal cases. So these are the main investigations we need to do in diverticular disease of the colon. When it is comes to treatment, right? When it is comes to treatment, there are non-operative management, and then there are emergency management, we have to do it as well as we have to consider there are surgical management in certain cases. So non-operative management are for a mild cases. So I have told you in the mild cases, they will present with uh, features as irritable bowel syndrome. So if it is a features appearance are mimicking as irritable bowel syndrome, it's a mild feature. So mild features, then we can go for a non-operative management. Non-operative management are we increase as the high fiber diet, because I have told you the low fiber diet will cause us pressure inside the lumen and that will cause us the propulsion of uh, whatever the diverticuli through the defective area. So that is what we call pulsion diverticuli. So that is all because of the low fiber diet. So we increase the fiber. So high fiber diet, then the pressure will be less because high fiber diet, the bowel motion or bowel movement will be normal or it is, uh, uh, it's increased. 
Then the bulk forming agent, we can give some bulk forming agents, even uh, laxatives, right? All that is considered as non-operative management. If a person is having a repeated pain, then we can give some antispasmodic. We call uh, hyosin butyl bromide is one of the antispasmodic. So we can give that as a non-operative management. When it is, comes to emergency management, but the person comes with the diverticulitis, or whenever the person comes with bleeding, or whenever somebody comes with the peritonitis, features of peritonitis, then we have to consider the emergency management. So we have to consider resuscitation. So in the resuscitation, we have to give IV fluids. Sometimes we need to put a nasogastric tube, and we have to restrict the oral intake in that pe people, as well as we have to go for a catheter. And with the catheter, we have to monitor the input-output chart. All it is comes under the resuscitation. So this resuscitation is one of the important management whenever somebody comes with the emergency presentation. Bed rest is again important because that will aggravate the conditions as well as whenever somebody is having a peritonitis, it will increase us the pain. So bed rest is again one of the important one. Even diverticulitis, just a diverticulitis. Again, the bed rest uh, uh, is can be given. As well as we have to start some IV antibiotic. It should cover the most of the organisms. So we call it a broad spectrum IV antibiotic. So usually, commonly, we start the basic broad spectrum antibiotic with uh, cefuroxim and metronidazole. So that is the common uh, IV antibiotics used for inflammatory condition of the bowel. And the surgery to be decided whenever the features of peritonitis or whenever there's a massive PR bleeding that is not responding to conservative management or a non-operative management, then we have to consider the surgery. And all these conservative measures are failed. Repeatedly, this person is having all uh, this uh, complication as well as the problem, then we have to consider the surgery. But whenever we do surgery, we can't go for a resection and anastomosis because most of the time we do surgery for some complicated cases. So there will be a perforation, there can be an abscess formation, there can be a pelvic abscess, there can be peritonitis. All these features, you can't do end-to-end -end anastomosis after the resection. So the best way is you resect the bowel whatever the uh, defective or uh, the diseased bubble, whatever the diseased bubble is resected and the proximal colon is created as an end colostomy and the distal part of the, uh, the uh, bubble or the rectum is closed and it is kept inside the abdomen. So this procedure is called Hartmann's procedure. So everybody knows that Hartmann's procedure is the safest surgical method whenever there's a complicated diverticular disease of the colon. So the proximal colon is taken as a end colostomy and the distal part after the resection, whatever the remaining distal part is closed and it is kept inside the abdomen. So that is the Hartmann procedure uh, is the option, surgical option in diverticular disease of the colon. So now trying to answer this question whatever we have discussed about diverticular disease of the colon. So which of the following statement regarding diverticular disease of the colon is true or false? High fiber diet causes the disease. It's false because we have discussed the low fiber diet is associated with the diverticular disease of the colon. The diverticular consists of mucosa, muscles, and the other parts is false again because it's a false diverticuli. So it is only consists of mucosa and the, those with inflammatory mass have 10 times mortality than those with perforation is false because the mortality is most uh, because of the perforation and the morbidity is mainly because of the inflammation. So again, remember, the mortality is mainly because of the perforation and the morbidity is mainly because of the diverticulitis. So mortality is more with perforation. So that is false. The next answer is diverticulitis is the principal cause of morbidity. Yes, that is true. So always remember diverticulitis forming the commonest morbidity and perforation will form in the commonest uh, mortality. And it is congenital. Again, it is false. It's not congenital. It is an acquired condition. Next one, true or false. 
which of the following are complications of diverticular disease of colon pericolic abscess yes so whenever there's an abscess formation pericolic abscess uh, is one of the presentation so that is true fistula formation yes we have discussed lower gastrointestinal hemorrhage yes sometimes they can uh, present with profuse bleeding right profuse bleeding so that is also true carcinoma no it is not a complication of diverticular disease it can coexist 12% of the time it can coexist but it is not a complication and stricture is again one of the complication because of the fibrosis whenever there is a perdiverticular uh, inflammation abscess formation they can develop a stricture formation and that can cause us intestinal obstruction as well the other single best answer we have started with a 10 month old child presented with fresh perectal bleeding for 2 days duration on examination child was pale and irritable there was a tachycardia and tachypnea what is the most probable diagnosis so remember if you get this kind of a question in a child less than 2 years of age presents with fresh pr bleeding number one cause we have to exclude is meckel's diverticulum so that is the common cause so the answer is meckel's diverticulum acute gastroenteritis you don't get a fresh pr bleeding into susception again i told you uh, into susception that can cause us bleeding but fresh pr bleeding into susception is not first diagnosis right we have to always think about meckel diverticulum as first one intestinal polyp again that can cause us uh, fresh pr bleeding but that is not the common cause so meckel diverticulum is the common cause colonic diverticulitis is rare in children it is it is uh, extremely it is in the elderly people so colonic diverticulitis is not the conditions in children so that is in rare in children so the answer is meckel's diverticulum in this question this is the other way 60 year so the previous one is a child this one is 60 year so when 60 year old person presents with profuse pr perectal bleeding our first thing we have to diagnose is diverticular disease of the colon so even rectal cancer they can have a, a rectal bleeding but that is not profuse ulcerative colitis usually they presents with blood and mucus right diarrhea so they won't mainly get a profuse pr bleeding and meckel's diverticulum in 60 year old it is rare right it is rare and i told you in uh, meckel's diverticulum in children presents with bleeding and in adult it is presents with diverticulitis so meckel's diverticulum causing bleeding is extremely rare in uh, extremely rare in elderly people the reason is when the meckel's diverticulum is causes bleeding there should be some gastric mucosa so whenever there is a gastric mucosa that will present in childhood because the gastric mucosa would remain for that uh, adult age period and then present as massive pr bleeding so it is extremely rare hemorrhoids everybody knows the common cause for pr bleeding if you get any question the common cause for pr bleeding in elderly people it's hemorrhoids but it won't cause profuse perectal bleeding so profuse perectal bleeding as well as severely anemic features are rare with hemorrhoids so hemorrhoid usually patient don't get severely anemic but whenever somebody comes to the severely anemic profuse pr bleeding diverticular disease of the colon is the first diagnosis we should make so that is the the most probable diagnosis the other single best answer question we have discussed already a 62 year old male presented with left sided abdominal pain for two weeks duration an exa examination he has marked tenderness over the left iliac fossa and he has the features of gastroesophageal reflux disease and goldstone this is what i told you it is a saint striad so this question is related to saint striad so whenever there is a saint striad you have to think about diverticular disease of the colon as well so this is what uh, we wanted to discuss so always the intestinal diverticula is very very important so you always need to know about the intestinal diverticula so there are two types of intestinal diverticula we have to discuss uh, we need to know one is the 
congenital diverticuli and it is called true diverticuli because it's all the layers are there in the diverticuli and the common example is the Meckel's diverticulum and it is occurs in children and the other variety that is acquired uh, diverticuli or a false diverticuli why we call it a false diverticuli because the, all the layers of the bowel are is not there and that is common in elderly and that is what we call the example is the diverticular disease of the colon and there are two types of uh, acquired di diverticuli it can be a pulsion diverticuli or it can be a uh, the traction diverticuli so pulsion diverticuli the problem is within the lumen and the traction diverticuli the problem is uh, outside the lumen and because uh, of the traction effect uh, people get diverticuli so that is what we have to discuss about diverticular disease uh, of the intestine or diverticuli of the intestine thank you